so welcome to the webinar, Six Steps to Creating a Cost of Operation Document. And uh, my name is Naeem Ali, and I'm going to be delivering this webinar today. <clears throat> so the agenda for today is uh, we're going to cover, I'm going to start off with, by talking about the, the acknowledgements and sources where I got this information from. I'll explain why we need a cost of operations document, what is a con ops, and then we'll dive into the six steps uh, to create this concept of operations document. This webinar should take about 45 to 50 minutes, uh, and then we can have a Q&A session at the end if anyone has uh, any questions uh, regarding the webinar itself. So who is this webinar for? Um, I created this webinar for transit agencies that are considering deploying a CBTC solution on their property. Because one of the things that I noticed is the expertise for CBTC, it's, uh, it's lacking a little bit in some of these organizations because uh, they, are, uh, they don't have the experience uh, deploying CBTC solutions on their property. They have conventional and traditional signaling experience, but not necessarily CBTC because it is a relatively new field. So I created this presentation or this webinar uh, geared towards these sorts of agencies. Uh, it's also towards, geared towards consultants who are working for transit agencies deploying a solution. Obviously, they're helping them uh, to implement a CBTC solution, and therefore, it would be, uh, it, it would, this webinar will help them as well. And transit agencies who have already deployed a CBTC solution on their property, and they may be seeking to find out if there are any gaps between what they have and what they may want. Uh, and this concept of operations document is a great tool to determine uh, if there is a gap or not. So by the end of this webinar, uh, you will understand the process to create a concept of operations document. And at the end of the presentation, I will have a template available uh, to you uh, if you would like to, 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 to use this template to create your own concept of operations document. It has my commentary in there, my thoughts, my ideas, topics uh, on what to consider when uh, when writing a con ops for a CBTC application. So before we begin, uh, just a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a CBTC specialist. I've been working in this industry for well over 15 years. Uh, I started off as a CBTC designer at Talus. I've worked there for about 15 years, uh, working in the software side, system side, and as a technical lead or technical manager on some of these projects that I worked on. Uh, I worked for three years after Talus as a CBTC consultant for Parsons. Uh, and then for the last two years, I've been working as an independent consultant uh, specializing in CBTC technologies. Uh, some of the projects that I've worked on, Toronto Transit Commission here in Toronto. Uh, this is the project I'm currently working on. Uh, Mecca Metro, Singapore, Edmonton North LRT, Newark, Jacksonville, Monorail, Las Vegas, which also happens to be one of the first radio-based CBTC solutions in the industry, uh, as well as Busan, Gimhe. So acknowledgements and sources. So I'd like to just mention Dr. Alan Rumsey. Uh, he is someone who has been promoting this idea of a con for the last several years. I, I heard about this through a conference that I attended last year in Philadelphia, where New York City Transit, uh, BART in San Francisco, and also the TTC here in Toronto, they all mentioned a con and the importance of it, and they all acknowledge uh, that Dr. Rumsey was the driving force behind uh, this, uh, this document. So I'd like to acknowledge him. Uh, and as well as my LinkedIn network, I had posted uh, several statuses uh, asking for feedback on what they would like to see, and I, and I received many private and public messages uh, of ideas of what I should talk about, so I'd like to acknowledge my LinkedIn network uh, as well. Sources. So this document, or this webinar, is based on two sources. One is the IEEE 29148 standard, uh, as well as the ANSI G043A uh, standard. Both these standards are very similar. Uh, they cover the same topics, but one, they both cover topics which the other does not, some topics. So I took a little bit of both from uh, both standards to create this, this webinar uh, in the CBTC space. So why do we need a con ops? So some transit agencies, when they begin this, uh, begin down the path, uh, of deploying a CBTC solution on their property. They just assume that the engineers, they understand their operational environment uh, and, and they dive right into a technical specification to write a CBTC uh, technical spec. This assumption is it's wrong because they are not the frontline personnel who are dealing with the issues day in and day out. Um, they, they, are, they are in the background supporting the frontline personnel. 
Now, what do I mean by frontline personnel? They are the people such as central control operators, the train drivers, maintenance personnel, the instructors, the passengers, people who are using the system every single day, trying to deal with the issues to get, keep the system going uh, and get riders to where they need to go. Uh, so a transit agency, they need to be able to extract the needs and priorities and concerns of the frontline personnel who are operating the system. And that is the point of the, of the CONOP. That is the primary objective of the CONOP, is to pull and extract these end user requirements uh, from these frontline personnel. Now, the impact of not creating a CONOP is you'll be missing functionality that your transit agency needs. Functionality that will surface towards the end of the project when the frontline personnel start to actually play with the system and, and ask questions such as, such as, I'd like to do this, or why can't the system do that? Uh, and by this point in the game, it's too late. Uh, because the, the cost to implement uh, functionality at the end of the project in the field deployment space, as you all very well know, is very expensive. And in some cases, it may not even be possible. So a CBTC solution will operate less than what was expected of it. And a CONOPS is there to pull these sorts of user type requirements uh, out of the frontline personnel before the project begins. Now keep in mind, this document is not an engineering document in the sense that you're not writing requirements like the system shall do this. If, you, if you're a system engineer, you know that word shall. It has a very specific connotation attached to it. This is not a technical specification. It is a document written for the lay person uh, that can be understood by anyone who picks it up and get an idea of what it is that the transit agency needs. And this is a very important point uh, to keep in mind. So what is a CONOPS? So if we go with the IEEE definition, a CONOPS is a user-oriented document that describes system characteristics of the to be delivered system from the end user's viewpoint. So basically what they're saying is, you are trying to figure out or trying to understand what the frontline personnel using the system is tr needs or what the priorities and concerns are in order for them to do their job. This is IEEE's definition. If you look at ANSI's definition, I'm not going to read that. It's, it's a mouthful. Uh, but if you do read it, it's basically saying the same thing. Uh, it's saying that we need to be able to extract the frontline personnel's uh, needs and priorities uh, and understand it to make sure we can address their concerns. So what is a CONOPS from a CBTC perspective? What I talked about earlier, the two definitions, they're generic definitions used across many industries, aerospace more specifically, because this is really where the CONOPS uh, is, is coming from. So in a CBTC perspective, um, it's written with the transit agency's end users uh, in mind. It does not describe the CBTC solution. Uh, this is a solution that's provided by the supplier. It's not talking about the core functionality. It's talking about the environment in which the CBTC solution resides in. Um, and upon completion, the engineers who use this, uh, uh, the CONOPS, they can use it to create the uh, technical specification. And when they do, it will be addressing directly the, con the, the priorities and concerns of the end users uh, of, the, of the system. So if we look at a typical CBTC system, it has your ATS, your wayside controller, your trainborne controller. And if we were to confine that into a circuit and call it a CBTC system, this is what the supplier is providing to the transit agency. Um, and, but the CONOPS, it's not concerned with the green part. It's only concerned about the blue part that's uh, enveloping the CBTC system or the, the environment in which the CBTC system is going to reside within. Uh, this is where all of the, the frontline personnel are, are working in order to meet the daily operational needs, uh, the maintenance personnel, the operators, the instructors, et cetera, et cetera. So the CONOPS is focused in the blue uh, shaded area uh, of the uh, transit agency's uh, environment. It is defining the operating environment. Okay, now we're going into the steps of creating a CONOPS. So, uh, the first step is we have to create a, a working room. Now, a CONOPS, it cannot be developed by one person or one department because this is a document that's trying to uh, define the operating environment from the end user's perspective. Well, there's not, there isn't any one user. There are multiple users that are in there, and I defined them earlier uh, of who those individuals are. Uh, so it has to be a cross-functional, uh, organizational-wide working group of representative from each working group uh, to sit as part of this, work, uh, this group to define what a CONOPS uh, is. It's an interdisciplinary team 
led by a systems engineer. So the work group would be comprised of your center control operator, trained drivers, maintenance personnel, instructors, uh, network maintainers, your in-house engineers, as well as CBTC experts or outside consultants uh, who can provide that expertise. Center control operators are those people that operate the system. They launch a train. They are the eyes and ears of your system. Obviously, they have an input into the system. Train divers, uh, they're in the tunnels, loaded with passengers in their train, uh, trying to make go from one station to the next. Maintenance personnel, these are the people that are involved, responsible for keep maintaining the system, and the system goes down to fix it and bring it back up as soon as possible. Instructors, these are the individuals that are training your personnel. Network maintainers, uh, they maintain your wired and wireless network. These are not, in, in the older conventional system, the wired and wireless network wasn't as critical as it is in a CBTC application because it is, it is directly affecting your signaling system. Uh, so in the CBTC space, uh, the network maintainers or IT personnel take on a more critical role. Uh, engineers, these are your in-house uh, engineers, uh, conventional, traditional signal engineers who understand the system that they have in place today. They definitely have an input into the system because there are, um, each transit agency is, has certain things that are unique to it uh, and these engineers will provide that, that understanding. And then finally, your CBTC experts. Uh, the CBTC uh, experts, they're not the same as the conventional, traditional signal engineers because the two experiences are very different. Uh, if you understand what a CBTC system does and how it works and how it's designed, and you look at how signal engineers design a traditional system, you realize the difference in, in the experience and the knowledge base uh, of the two engineers. So you do need a CBTC expert to make sure that the working group does not get diverted and go down a rabbit hole uh, and, and, and get stuck in a dead end. The, the CBTC experts will pull them out of those holes uh, and keep it going in, in the right direction. So these are the people that will create the working group uh, and they'll bring up their own perspective to the table and you'll have a, a, a con ops that is reflective of what the organization uh, really needs. So step two, defining CBTC user priorities and concerns. So if we go uh, back to our diagram and look at the uh, environment, we have our CBTC system in the center. Uh, we have the operating environment that's, that's enveloping it. Now we need to define who are the users of this CBTC system. So we start listing them out and, and adding to this mind map. So if we start off, we can say that there are operators. Uh, there is the yard operator as well as the mainline operator. They're the ones controlling the system, seeing all the trains on the system, when it's being launched, when it's being taken out of service, if there's a problem, if there's a need to react, et cetera. We can add train drivers. They're the ones in the tunnels driving those trains. Uh, we have maintenance personnel, and that can be broken out further into trackside and vehicle maintenance personnel, uh, who are the, the individuals that actually maintain the system. We have instructors, who are the ones responsible for training all the personnel in how to operate the system. Uh, we have IT personnel. They're the ones that maintain the network, the wired and the wireless. Uh, emergency first responders. Now, at first blush, you would not think that they are a user of the system, but they are. They do have requirements. When there's an emergency at track level, they need to make sure that the area is cleared of all trains, that traction power is cut, tunnel vent doors are closed, and the ventilation fans are on, etc. So they have an input into the system. The CBTC system may be controlling some of these things. Uh, so they, they are definitely individual or users of, of the system. And finally, passengers, for obvious reasons. They are the individuals, they are the people, your ridership who are using the system uh, day in and day out, and they definitely have an input in terms of what type of a CBTC system that they need. Now, once we have defined all of the uh, users of the system, we need to understand what are their priorities and concerns. So we just continue along the same path uh, that we've been following and keep adding to the mind map. Uh, so if we start off with the trained drivers, uh, we can say that the train driver is concerned with the uh, status and the alarms, uh, train mode, the availability, uh, vehicle redundancy, trackside redundancy, um, and these are their concerns. Because the driver, they need to know what the status of the train is. If there are any alarms coming in, do they need to react? They need to, be, they need to know what type of modes are available to them. Is there fully automatic? Is it an ATP protected? Is it manual or cut out? Um, uh, and see, these are the concerns for the train driver. For maintenance personnel, 
They're concerned with reliability and maintainability. Um, if we look at a trackside personnel, they're concerned with level two diagnostics. Um, level two diagnostics is my term. I defined it in a white paper I wrote on the seven key CBTC function transit operators should understand. Uh, you can download that white paper from my, web, from my website uh, and it can go into more detail on what that actually means. But the point here is they need diagnostics. They need to understand where the, if there is a problem, where it happened and to isolate it and localize it so they can, they can get to it as soon as possible. Uh, track size special tools. Is there a laptop? Is there a special cable? Is there special equipment they need to maintain their system? That needs to be defined. Uh, work zone protection. When track site personnel are at track level, how are they protected? Because if the system is in operation during revenue service, there needs to be a mechanism in place to be able to protect those workers uh, all at track level. Because in a CVTC system, uh, trying to protect workers at track level is very different from a traditional system. Work cars. Work cars need to be, uh, these, these are cars that are used to take uh, maintenance personnel uh, at track site and get them to the destination where the problem is. But the problem here is, should the work cars be tracked? Should they be uh, managed by procedure? Uh, these are the questions that need to be answered uh, for work cars. For vehicle personnel, it's no different. They need to have special tools as well as diagnostics, no different than the wayside, uh, to be able to do their jobs. For the operators, uh, some of the concerns that may pop up is uh, for the yard operator, uh, launching trains into and out of service, uh, may, moving trains around in the yard. For the mainline operators, they need to have reports to understand what, how the system is performing. Uh, they, need to they need to have the ability to recover failed trains. Now, how do you recover a failed train? Do you have secondary train detection or follow that mode of operation? Uh, do you use procedures or is there something designed into, C into the CBTC design which can recover these, these trains? The operators are concerned with regulation, recovering from a perturbation in the system, uh, availability, and if we break that out further, we could say redundancy of central, the track side, the vehicle, the network. Uh, they need level one diagnostics. These are alarms that are coming in indicating if the train emergency brake, if it was able to reset its emergency brakes, uh, if the doors did not open, if the switch is stuck. Alarms that indicate if there is a problem that needs to be addressed. Uh, the user interface, this is the GUI that the operators are using. Is it user friendly? Are there certain colors you want? Or is there a certain layout that, that the, uh, the personnel, the operators need? And then finally, a cutover strategy. Uh, if it's a simple, small system, you may go with a big bang approach and just cut the whole system over to CBTC in one shot. Or if it's a long 30 kilometer line, you may break it up into phases. Uh, but it's a, a discussion that needs to take place of what type of a cutover strategy that you need that will have the least disruption to your ridership while trying to uh, deliver the system as fast as possible or as soon as possible. Moving on to the instructors, uh, their concerns are having tools to be able to train uh, the personnel. Uh, they would need a trackside simulator, a central simulator, a, a vehicle simulator, and the training material that goes along with it for them to be able to train the personnel uh, properly. IT personnel, they are concerned with the network itself, the wired and the wireless. They're, they are interested in network security. When you have a wired or sorry, a wireless network, uh, anyone can access it. So what kind of security is in place? Is it encryption? Is it authentication? Um, so they're concerned with security. They need level two diagnostics to be able to find out if there's any problems in their network. The network needs to be reliable and there needs to be redundancy. So these are some of the concerns from an IT perspective. For the passengers, uh, they need to be informed of what's going on, whether it's on the train or on the platform. Such uh, uh, information such as uh, the next platform they're traveling to, how long will it take before the next train arrives? If there's a problem on the track, why they stop? Information just to keep them informed of what's happening. Um, so a piss pass system is a, is, a, is a concern. Platform doors, train doors, this is the uh, doors that are used by the driver or by the by the ridership. So it's a very critical piece of infrastructure. Um, are the doors wide enough? Can it handle handicap? Can it handle wheelchairs? Um, if the train gets stuck, how many times it's going to uh, recycle? Uh, questions of that nature. Uh, on time service. Uh, obviously, they want to make sure that the trains are arriving on time and and moving and uh, taking them to their destination on time. Ride quality. You don't want passengers to be jerked around on the train. So you don't want a hard braking, hard acceleration. 
it needs to be a nice smooth ride and when it comes into a station it should be a nice smooth stop so it's a it's a concern for a passenger uh, in terms of, of ride quality in in a traditional system when you have a driver on board every driver has its own driving characteristics in a CVTC application all trains are the same because it is an onboard unit which is uh, been programmed, I, it, it, which is identical on every single vehicle. So ride quality um, is a concern and there are requirements that can be placed on the CVTC system. For emergency first responders, as I mentioned earlier, uh, if there's a problem on track level, they want to make sure that the trains are cleared from the trouble zone, traction power is cut, tunnel vent doors are closed, tunnel ventilation doors are on, and there may be other requirements from the first responders uh, for them to be able to react to any emergency situation. So once we've gone through this exercise, we've identified all the users uh, of our system. We've identified all of their concerns and priorities. Now we need to understand what are the system capabilities and try to feed these, these concerns and priorities into the CBTC system. And that's what brings us to step number three, which is to translate these priorities into system capabilities. So the point of this exercise is now to take all these priorities and feed it into the CVTC system uh, and try to find out what are the, the, the capabilities that the CVTC system has to do. Now, we're kind of getting into the engineering side here, but it is still not a requirement specification. We're just taking broad topics, making broad brush comments uh, about how the system should behave uh, from a user's perspective. Uh, so that's the green arrows feeding into the CVTC system. The blue arrows are, well, the operating environment may need to be adapted to uh, work with the CVTC application because keep in mind, the reason the CVTC application is being deployed is to take advantage of efficiencies, to be able to pump more trains through the system, bring trains closer together. Well, if you're putting a system like this uh, into a system that, was, that had a conventional, traditional conventional system, well, the operating environment may not be suited for a CBTC application, which means you have to modify your environment or adapt your environment to, to work with the capabilities that a CBTC system has to offer. And that's the blue lines that are coming out, that are radiating out from the CBTC system itself. So when we're defining CBTC capabilities, we're going to try to create some uh, large, bigger topics. So if we look at the operators, uh, we realize that all of their their concerns and priorities are issues that are related to central control. So we create a topic called central control and everything that's in the red circle there would fall under this uh, category. For the instructors, uh, they're concerned with simulators. So we create a topic called simulators and all topics related to that, such as trackside central vehicle simulator would fall under this uh, subcategory. For the IT personnel, uh, we'll just create a topic called network and anything related to the wireless and the wired network would fall under, under that category. For train drivers, they're concerned with everything that's on the train. So we create a subgroup or a topic called train and anything related to the train would fall under that category. For maintenance personnel, we just create a topic called maintenance and then we can maybe break it down further and, and call it trackside vehicle personnel. Um, and, the, and, and every single topic for maintenance would fall under there. For emergency first responders, we would have an emergency response category and anything related to emergencies would fall under this topic. Now for passengers, uh, you can't really create a topic on its own. So we would feed some of their priorities and concerns into existing topics. Um, things like, if you look at the blue arrows, the platform doors and train doors and train performance, they're clearly train, uh, train issues. So you'd put those topics into the train uh, category. The green arrows for on-time service and overcrowding on the platform, these are more central type of issues uh, where you're trying to service a platform or you're trying to make sure the system is on time. So we would feed those two topics into the central control uh, category. Now, once you finish that exercise, you'll also realize there are certain uh, concerns or priorities which are common to several users. Redundancy is one of them. Uh, the operators are concerned with the redundancy, central trackside vehicle network. Uh, IT personnel are concerned with redundancy at the network layer. Uh, train drivers are concerned with redundancy uh, on the train and the, and the trackside. So if you see something that's common like that, uh, I would create a separate topic and call it redundancy. 
just to make sure that the type of requirements we're writing isn't focused on any one user, it is addressing all users or the entire system at, at the same time. Diagnostics is another category. Operators need diagnostics, IT personnel need diagnostics, uh, and trackside vehicle maintenance personnel need diagnostics. Now, the diagnostics is not the same for each user, but you do want a diagnostics architecture that is uh, that'll serve the entire organization at the same time. You again, don't want to create diagnostics that's focused on any one user. It needs to be a, a systems view of diagnostics to make sure everyone's needs are addressed. So we would create a topic called diagnostics. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, passenger information announcement system, the, the PIS pass, uh, it didn't really fall into a, a category by itself. So we would create a, a category or a topic called PIS Pass on its own. And this address all passenger related issues. You may rename PIS Pass uh, to passengers or riders uh, and, and list out some topics that are of concern to the riders, uh, to the ridership that doesn't necessarily fall into other, other categories. So once we create all the system capabilities, we now need to kind of define the subtopics within each one of those capabilities. Now, I'm not going to go through every single topic that I identified earlier, but I'll give one example. If we look at simulators, we have trackside vehicle central uh, simulators as well as the training material. For each one of those subgroups, we would expand on it further, indicating what type of simulator we want. Uh, what should it be able to do for the for the instructor to be able to do their job. So, in this section here, uh, we would now expand on the capabilities of of the uh, of that particular subgroup uh, and, and the material and if you do that for each and every single topic you'll have an understanding of the type of system that your or the type of system that you need or the capabilities that you need from the CBTC uh, solution that's delivered by the supplier now the the next topic is uh, modifying the operating environment now as I mentioned earlier uh, not only are you um, defining capabilities that you're expecting from the CVTC solution, but you also want to understand the capability that CVTC brings to the table and whether or not the operating environment needs to be modified. Uh, and, and the purpose here is to take advantage of the capabilities that CVTC has to offer. You don't want to be stuck in a traditional model with a brand new system. So you need to take a critical look at your environment and determine, okay, do we need this department still? Or do we need to change their job responsibilities? Do we need to get different type of people in these roles to be able to manage the CBTC system? These are the sort of questions that need to be answered to see, if the, see how the operating environment is going to be modified. And it's not a question of if it should be modified, it is a question of what's going to be modified because it really does change how the organization operates in this new uh, signaling uh, environment. So you need to ask these, these questions uh, as part of the CONOPS to understand uh, how you will adapt your uh, operating procedures and whatnot. Step four. So now, what we've done so far is we've looked at the system from an individual user's perspective, and we looked at their priorities and concerns and defined system capabilities. We're not going to raise the discussion just a little bit higher now and look at it from a higher system level view which is the operations. How is the system operating, or how, do, how does the transit, transit authority want the system uh, to operate? So I broke this up into two broad categories. One is the yard and depot, because that is a, a separate entity on its own, and the mainline operations. If we start with the yard operations, uh, we have here our typical yard. It, uh, the blue is the yard, or the depot, and the green is your mainline operations. Now, usually, many transit agencies, if not all of them, are their organizations are broken up by mainline and the depot. And one of the common mistakes that, uh, excuse me, one of the common mistakes that some of these agencies will make is they'll say CBTC goes on the mainline and the depot will remain conventional because it's a cost issue. But you can't approach it this way. A CBTC system needs to have control of as much part of the property as possible in order to be able to efficiently operate the system. And this applies to the yard as well. The CBTC system has to come into the yard to be able to launch these trains at the appointed time efficiently. If you have, if you have a human operator uh, managing that, you'll get into some trouble. So 
the CVTC system has to, as a bare minimum, be able to control hostel or the launch point where the trains will be launched from. The pink area is the CVTC control area. The blue is the, the uh, traditional or manual or the old signaling system that, that may be there. Um, and in this situation, the train, the storage lane, will be driven in manual to the hostler. It would put it into a CVTC control mode, do its self-test, whatever may be necessary. And at the appointed time, the system would automatically launch that train into the, the main line. Uh, you may want to extend this further and say uh, the CVTC control area will be extended to the storage lane, which means in this scenario, the system would wake up the train, perform its self-test, move the train automatically to the hostler or the launch point, uh, and then uh, launch at the appointed time into the mainland. The point here is a discussion needs to take place by the authority and its, uh, and its people to determine how much control do you want the CVTC system uh, in, in to control in the yard. Uh, do you want it a bare minimum hostler? Do you want it partial or do you want it full? So it's a discussion that needs to take place because it is a cost uh, issue um, re related to this decision. Now, mainline operations. For mainline operations, you first need to understand what type of patterns you're running on the system. It may be a single clockwise uh, loop. You may have a sub loop in there somewhere depending on uh, the time of day, maybe in rush hour, you need more trains in a certain part of the track, not so much in other parts of the track, so you have uh, uh, smaller patterns that need to be run. You need to understand your normal daily operations, and you also need to ask yourself the question, with CVTC in place, are there new patterns that you may want to run? Um, in which case, you would define those so you can feed that into the technical specification in, in, in the future. You need to identify where are the pocket tracks. Um, these are locations on the track which a train will sit there and, at the, and if it's needed, it'll be launched into the system. In a CBTC application, this, become, this is a very critical piece of information. Uh, it needs to be able to memorize its location so when it powers down and powers up again, it knows where it is. Uh, because if this feature is not there and you power down that train, it's going to forget where it is and you have to re-enter the train, localize it, etc., which is a time-consuming task. So you have to identify these special locations on the track um, that, that exist for that particular property. You need to identify, uh, is a CBTC system going to run with equipped and unequipped trains, or CBTC equipped trains and non-CBTC trains? Um, how do you handle that? Are you going to be able to uh, track that train by procedures? Are you going to implement secondary detection or fallback mode of operation? Or is there going to be a design in place in the CBTC to be able to protect that train? This is a very expensive decision. Uh, if you decide to go with secondary train detection, the complexity, the level of complexity that's added is exponential. Um, not to mention the fact that you have to maintain that fallback mode of operation. So it's, it's a discussion that needs to take place whether you really need secondary detection or not. Most systems don't, but many transit agencies, uh, it just gives them a sense of comfort uh, by adding a secondary train detection, but it's really a decision that should be based on a proper business case, not on a gut feel. Modes of operation. Uh, your system can take several modes. There's a normal mode, a fallback mode, a self-regulating mode. You can have a backup control center. Several modes at a system level that, uh, that are applicable that the operator would have to make a decision on. The trains also have their modes. Uh, typical are your automatic mode, uh, protected manual mode, manual mode, cutout mode. So you need to define what type of modes this system and the train are going to be operating within. Train recovery, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, how do you recover a failed train? To me, a failed train on the track is a remote possibility, meaning you lost communication with that train um, uh, and how do you recover it? Uh, if you're able to figure out how to recover a failed train in the system, uh, you can probably handle just about any failure that system may exhibit. Um, so, but how do you recover it? Do you use procedures? Do you use secondary train indexion? Do you have a design in place to recover that train uh, um, by, by design? Uh, so it's a discussion that has to take place. Work zones, uh, you need to define uh, how automatic trains are going to move through a work zone. In a traditional system, you have a driver on board. Uh, it's identified that there is a work zone. You may have a blue light in place indicating that there are workers at track level. The driver will see that and they will slow the train down and move slowly through that area. But in a CBTC application where there may not be a driver on board, or even if there is, it's an automatic system. The driver may not be paying attention. 
How do you move a train through a work zone and protect your track workers at track level? Well, this is what the discussion that has to take place here. Are you going to be using procedures, manual procedures, or is there a design going to be in place? Does the automatic train come in, uh, slow down, and move slowly through the, uh, through the area, or does it stop, put into a, a, a manual mode, and the driver move the train through that area? Uh, is it going to be a vital function or a non-vital function? These are the discussions that have to take place. Many suppliers, at least what I've seen to date, um, have a work zone function that is heavy on procedures. Um, and the transit agencies really need to push the suppliers to make it more automatic, make it vital, uh, and safety uh, to, to make sure that their workers are protected at track level. So work zones is another operational topic that should happen. Work cars. Uh, work cars are, it's a topic that's, I find at least that's uh, not discussed properly uh, by many agencies. They just kind of assume work cars is an, more of an afterthought. Only when the project has started do they realize that work cars is a, is a critical topic. A work car is very different from a passenger train. A passenger train is consistent. Uh, it has the same length, let's say six cars. It has the same braking characteristics. It has the same acceleration curves. Um, every passenger train is the same from one train to the next. Uh, so a consistent set of rules and design principles can be applied. For a work car, it's very dynamic. It can be in any type of a configuration. Um, uh, you can have a balance buggy attached to it. You can have a flatbed attached to it. You can have a crane attached to it. And it can be in various configurations. And each configuration brings its own braking curve with it, acceleration curve with it, stopping distance uh, attached to it. Uh, the length is different from one, one configuration to the next. So it becomes a very complicated design. Uh, and it needs to be decided whether uh, a work car is going to be equipped with CVDC equipment or not. And if it's not equipped, how do you track that work car at track level? Is it secondary train detection or is it by procedures uh, or not? If it's equipped, well, then it's treated like a passenger train, but it is complicated. So depending on the size of the work car fleet for the organization, the decision will be based on that. If it's maybe one or two work cars, you can get away with procedures. If you have 80 work cars, well, you probably need a design in place to be able to track this train at track level without interrupting revenue service. So it's a very critical decision. It's a very expensive decision um, because not only is it equipping the, the work cars with CVTC equipment, it's also deciding uh, whether that fleet can, is, is CVTC ready. If some parts of your work car fleet are not CVTC ready, you may need to decommission it and, and procure new work cars. Or maybe existing work cars need to be upgraded to, be, to make them CVTC ready. So it's a very expensive decision. Uh, the capital costs are very high. Um, so it's a very critical decision and the discussion has to take place upfront to know exactly uh, how, uh, how costly the system is going to be and what you need to do in order to be able to control some of these work cars. So we've gone through this, the, the operations. Now step five is establishing your system boundaries and what the CVTC system, which uh, subsystem or third party suppliers the CVTC system is going to be interfacing with. So we apply the same mind map uh, to, to this discussion as well. We have our CVTC system and then we identify all the external interfaces that are interfacing with it, such as rolling stock, train doors, platform doors, uh, traction power, tunnel ventilation doors, piss pass, switch machine, SCADA, and there may be other items. But each topic should be identified and then expanded on further to determine how it interfaces with the CVTC system, what's expected from that subsystem, and what's expected from the CVTC system as, uh, as well. So you need to define all your interfaces and system boundaries. So finally, once you've gone through these steps, you should have a very good idea of the type of CVTC solution that you, that, that you need. And now it's simply a matter of writing that concept operation document. Now, this is a table of contents that I've extracted from IEEE and ANSI. Many of the topics are coming from those two standards. I've just tailored it to the CVTC space. Now, you don't need to read this whole thing now. My template covers this already. I just wanted to highlight some of the broad, some of the high level topics that are there. Uh, everything that I've discussed in this webinar is covered here, but not everything. Take for example, section two, the existing signaling system. Obviously the operator understands that better than anyone else and they could handle that topic on their own. 
Justification, well, that will become self-explanatory once you've gone through this exercise, why you're justifying the need for a CBTC system. Uh, section 4.0, which is the operating environment, this was step number two of my webinar, which defines the users, the priorities and concerns. Uh, section 5.0, which is a proposed CBTC system overview. overview. This was step, uh, step four, which defines the system, cap or sorry, step three, which defines the system capabilities uh, based on the priorities and concerns of the, uh, uh, of the users and operators. 5.5 uh, is system interface and boundaries, which we just talked about earlier, is defining all the boundaries and the third party suppliers that the CPT system would have to interface with. And then 6.0, which is operational scenarios, uh, which talks at a high level some of the operation scenarios that a transit agency would need to uh, would need to deal with. I've highlighted a few topics here. There may be more. Every agency has uh, other operation scenarios that they, need, that they would like to document and possibly have the CBTC system uh, addressed. And then section 7.0, which is to analyze the proposed system. This is the template that I triple and ANSI uh, recommend should be followed. Um, I just tailored it uh, to the CBTC space. There are some topics that I ignored, some topics that I included, um, but I've customized it for uh, a CBTC application. So that was step six. So to wrap this up, in conclusion, um, a CONOPS is a user-oriented document that contains the needs and priorities of the transit agencies for my personnel. I hope that I've convinced you uh, why you need to understand the end users uh, priorities and and the conops is dedicated to that user. It is not an engineering document. It is a, a document written in a narrative style with many illustrations, written for the lay person that anyone can pick it up and read it and understand what type of a system that the transit agency would need. It can be used as part of a business case. Um, it is not a detailed technical specification. It feeds a technical uh, specification. It does not contain detailed requirements. If you notice, I've not talked about core CVTC functionality, things like train tracking or positioning or switch control or routing. These are topics that are dealt with in the technical stack by the supplier. And from the end user's perspective, they expect that to be working when it's finally delivered. Uh, to them, it's transparent. It's all working in the background. What they're concerned with are the daily issues to keep the trains running and, and a and keep the riders moving from one place to the other. So we're focusing on those topics to make sure that the CBTC system can, can address those needs. So core functionality is not discussed in this, top, in this document. That is dealt with by the engineers in the technical specifications uh, when that technical spec, spec is, is written. The CONOPS is a working group, uh, is an interdisciplinary team of frontline personnel that are taken from across a transit agency's organization uh, to get input from various perspectives to make sure that everyone's views are addressed by the system. Uh, a properly written CONOPS will take several months, minimum several weeks, because this is not written by one person or one group. Uh, it is written by the organization. <clears throat> and if it's written, <clears throat> excuse me. If it's written properly, you may have subcommittees that have to explore certain topics further. It may require two or three uh, specialized people to expand on certain topics further. So a proper con ops will take time. Uh, it's not a quick exercise. So next steps. As I mentioned to you earlier, uh, I've created a con ops template based on the two standards that I mentioned. Um, it's a generic template for any transit agency. Uh, and it can be tailored for, for any agency uh, out there. Uh, if you're interested in, in getting a copy of that template, just send me an email at the email that I've listed before and I'll be happy to uh, uh, send you a, a copy. And if you do take the template and you fill it out, you create your own concept of operations document, you can uh, request me to have a review of that con ops. I'd be more than happy to have a look at it and give you my thoughts, my ideas, uh, things to add, things to avoid. Um, and you can send me a request uh, to the email that I've, that I've listed below. So that is the end of my webinar uh, on the six steps to creating a concept operation document. It's, a, it's the steps that I created based on my experience <clears throat> and based on looking at the standard uh, on what I see are some of the high level topics that need to be dealt with. And if you do follow these steps, I do believe you have a very good grasp of the operating environment that your transit agency is working within. And, uh, uh, and I, I believe that it'll be a very useful exercise. So if anyone has any questions, 
I can take them now. If there are no questions, thank you for attending.